Thank you. So at the fall of the Soviet Union, they had desperate need for, for money. And so they started printing money like there was no tomorrow. There was very high inflation. And people moved to commodity monies. And here's an example of school teachers being paid. A couple of interesting things to see about this pic. These, of course, are being paid in vodka, which as you, as you would expect. It's very, very good money if you're going to use a metallic money. Um, it has a nice feature compared to, say, sheep or something like that that if you want, you can buy very small things by just a small amount of vodka. So, th so that's nice. You can see that some school teachers are being paid just a little. Some are being paid more. And this woman here, she's seen a lot of shit. There's a lot of stuff that's gone down, and this is just one more. Um, but yeah, th this is the thing. So this is a thing that actually does happen. It's a, it's a thing, but of course, hopefully, we don't see too much of that in our near future because we are on fiat money, for better or worse. Okay, so here's where we were. We said money is going to be for us anything that does the things that money does. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on the medium of exchange. So anything that serves as a medium of exchange in our economy, we're going to call money. And a medium of exchange really just has to do with liquidity, how easy it is to spend. If you accept this thing, how easy it is to put, pass it on to the next guy to get the stuff that you actually want. So we have ordered things in our economy vaguely by liquidity. Okay? This is not a perfect ordering because some things are more liquid in some circumstances and less liquid in other circumstances. But this is just to give you an idea what we're talking about, um, and in particular, for this class, and pretty much macroeconomics in general, if you say the word money, we want you to be thinking in terms of M1. In particular, when we say the word money, we want you to be thinking about checking account balances. Okay? That is the vast majority of what we think of as money, and the important thing about checking account balances, if you have money in your checking account, you can spend it after class. Right? So it is very liquid, it's very easy to spend the money in your checking account, and so therefore, if we're wondering, do people spend? Do they have enough liquidity to, to buy something? Checking account balances count. Now, for a lot of stories, other things would count as well. It depends on what we're talking about. Does a company have enough money to buy a factory? Well, then things like stocks and bonds and time deposits are important as well. Right? But for pretty much everything, almost everything, everything legal for sure, checking account balances will do it. So we want to be thinking checking account balances, which means all of a sudden we're talking about banks, right? Because checking account balances are, are a banking phenomenon. And so because of this, we need to talk about the banking system. Now, normally I have a big lecture about the banking system and all of that, and, and we sort of walk, walked our way through it. But things have happened during our break. In particular, during our break, Silicon Valley Bank went under, and it was like a whole big thing in the news. I don't know if you guys were following this, but it, it, it was a thing. And so I am rearranging the lecture a bit, and I'm going to talk about the banking system today and maybe on Friday, and then we'll go about and talk about the money supply and that kind of thing later. Usually I do it the other order, but clearly we need to talk about the banking system because it's, it's going on in the world, right? So what's going on with Silicon Valley Bank? Well, if you see this guy, this guy is Peter Thiel. You might not know him, but he's Peter Thiel, he's the, the big, big billionaire. And uh, we don't get sound. It's so sad. It's so sad. Anyway, you know, this is Mary Poppins, right? This is, this is the thing. This is the run on the bank in Mary Poppins. This is exactly what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. Somebody said they want their money back, and they were worried they weren't going to get it. And all of a sudden, everyone wants their tuppence, and, and there you go. All right, so we'll leave this because we don't have sound. Oh, it's so sad. Move right along. Okay. So why does that happen? Why do banks work like that? And it used to be back in the day in the 1800s, this kind of thing happened all the time. Every couple of years, there'd be another 100 banks that went under in a mad panic and people lining up and fighting for their money, a lot of people not getting it. This was a usual, not normal, but repeated thing that happened over and over and over again. Um, and it hasn't been happening so much since the 30s. 
like the big wave of it in the 30s, but since then it hasn't been happening much. So to understand why not, we need to talk about how a bank works and what has changed since the 30s. Now clearly it still happens because the Silicon Valley Bank was exactly like this. Um, it wasn't physical, people didn't run in, but they did call, make phone calls in the same panic, right? So the, you know, it was a bank where people had 50 million in the bank, right? And so it wasn't you run down and you get your 50 million, but you call up the banker and you say, I want my money. Right? So it was exactly the same thing. It just didn't happen physically. It happened by the phone. Okay, so to see how a bank works, let's suppose that I wanted to start a bank. And I'm in a great position to, to start a bank because everyone trusts me. After the bond thing, we know that everyone thinks that I'm going to pay stuff back. Actually, I didn't pay it back in public, but honest, I paid it back. I paid back the bond, right? No one buys it. I did, honest, I did. I paid back the bond. Um, I, I should have done it in public. Um, <laughs> and so I want to start a bank. And the nice thing about me is that I have this space here. This is mine, my own little domain. And so you guys are all coming to university. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the Bank of Ivan. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to get all of you guys to deposit in my bank. And it's nice for you because it's right at UCD where you're coming anyway. And so you won't have any troubles with AIB. You know they're jerks. And so you'll, you'll come to me and it will be great. And so what I do to start this bank of Ivan is, first of all, this doesn't look right. And so I do it all in marble, you know, like some kind of Saul Goodman sort of situation with columns and stuff. Um, I do that. And I even we trust on the wall. And, and I, I do that so that it looks good, it looks prestigious, it looks solid. And then I say, come, give me your money. I will keep it safe. Whenever you want your money, I will give it back to you. This is exactly what AIB does, exactly what Silicon Valley Bank does, exactly what they all do. So you put your money in, I'll keep it safe for you. Right? I might give you some convenient stuff, like I might have an ATM or something. And this is great. This is a good deal for you, if, if you're not very bright. And you can come to me, give me your money, and I'll just sit on it, and I'll give it back to you whenever you want. Okay? Great. No troubles. Well, legal issues, which we'll come to. But other than that, no troubles. Well, one trouble. One trouble is that I am going to go out of business really quickly, right? Because I have now expenses, but I have no income. If you give me 100 euros, I have to pay for the marble. I have to stand here waiting for you, you to get your money back. I need to perhaps make an ATM machine. I need accountants. I need all kinds of stuff. These are all expenses. And I've got no money coming in whatsoever. I've got your 100 euros that you paid me, but I have to hold on to it in case you want it back. Okay. This is called 100% reserve banking. This is when you give me, my, give me money, if you give me your deposit, right? you deposit money with the bank, I keep 100% of that in a reserve under my desk, under my mattress, in the safe, so that you can have it whenever you want. No bank that you have ever met in your life runs on 100% reserve banking. This is not how they're done. I only know in the world, and there may be more, but I only know one bank that runs on 100% reserve banking, and that's Whore's Bank which is not spelled the way you think, but it is from the Hoare family, which is an ancient British family who has been rich since the dawn of time and has been doing banking to the aristocracy since the 1500s. And so they've been doing this thing where you, you deposit money with them, and one of the types of accounts they have is a 100% reserve account where they put, you put your money in and they just sit on it like, like a dragon on his gold. And they keep it safe for you. And that's nice because they've got a safe and whatnot, whereas you might not have an industrial safe in your house, and therefore you got someone to sit on your money. Okay? It's a really goofy sort of situation because clearly that's an expense for them. They need to pay for the safe, they need to pay for the advertising, um, and all of that. But they got no income from that. So the way they make money on that is, one, they charge you a fee, fairly substantial fee to keep your money there. And two, they try to upsell you on investment vehicles. Put your money in this, and we got the guy. And so I, I, I'm like trying to figure out, I heard from a historian about Horus Bank, um, who, who had done like a history of this particular bank since the 1500s and, and 
carried through all the, the accounts from the 1500s. I'm like trying to figure out how these guys make money. And I look at their website, it becomes very, very obvious how they make their money. What they do is they have investment workshops of all their clients. And so you go to the investment workshop, they try to sell you on some products. And the nice thing about going to this investment workshop is you get to hang out with all the other lords and ladies and whatnot that are at the investment workshop. It's very much, except my daughter to St. Andrews, um, if you go to the PTA meeting of St. Andrews, nobody's concerned about the kids. They're all concerned about schmoozing with each other and, and getting the next deal going. Um, so it's that kind of thing. If you put these rich people together and you get a service fee because of that. AIB, Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley Bank, none of them work on this system. Okay? It is just Horst Bank. There is, as far as I know, no one else. Okay? The way they work is they don't keep 100% in reserves. They don't, if you give them 100 euros, they don't put 100 euros in the vault and just sit there, right? Because there's no income from that. There's just expenses. They need some way to make income. And so what they do is you put in your 100 euros, they take 10 of it and they put it in the, in the safe and they take 90 of it and they loan it out to somebody else. Right? And then, say they loan it out at, at say 1% per week. Right? This is a ridiculously high amount, but suppose they lo loan it out for 1%. So they've loaned that out to somebody for a week and at the end of the week they're gonna get paid the 90 back and they're gonna get nine euros, well, what, 90 cents extra. And so there, because they've loaned it out to someone who's paying them interest, if you don't come and get your money during the entire week, they've made 90 cents in profit because they get to keep that interest because they didn't promise you any interest, but they've loaned it out to somebody who will pay them interest and that's how they make their money. So they keep a fraction of your deposits in reserve and they loan the rest of it out to somebody else. Okay, this is called fractional reserve banking they keep a fraction in reserve. <laughs> yes, it's just that simple. Horace Bank keeps 100% in reserve, hence 100% reserve banking. These guys keep a fraction in reserve, fractional reserve banking. So simple. Right. Um, which is great, it's great. It works really well. They make a profit, everyone's good. Um, there is a bit of a downside. And the downside is, you give me your 100 euros, put it in Bank of Ivan, I'm not making any money here. I got to pay for the Saul Goodman set. And so what I need to do is I need to, to keep some of it in reserve and send the rest of it off to loan out to somebody, right? No problem. And if you come back and you ask for 10 euros, I say, no problem. I got your money right here. Anytime you want your money, just come on back. And I give you your 10 euros. You go on your merry way. And I say, no problem. Come back, get more. And inside I'm sweating bullets because I only had the 10 euros, right? I loaned it out to Harry and the, the rest of the 90 is gone, I won't get it back for a week, I got nothing in the till, but I'm cool. I just say, there you go, yeah, anytime you want, come on back, okay? And then I just pray that you don't come back, because if you do come back and you ask for another euro, I don't got it, I just don't. And so, what can you do? Then the bank goes under, the banking regulator comes in, they close me down, it, it's a whole kerfuffle, right? And I'm out of, out of, out of the business. Now this is potentially a perfectly well-run bank. There is nothing that I've done here that is wrong. This is what all the banks do all the time. You might think it's wrong, but it's not wrong in the world of banking. It is normal, normal for banks. They take your money in, they loan most of it out to somebody, and not usually for a week. Usually they loan it out like they give someone a home loan, and they won't get it paid back for 30 years. Right? So it's gonna be a while. Um, so this, this is a problem, but it's not quite as bad as you think. Because if I do this with 10 people, and I get 10 of you to each put in 100 euros, and for each of you, I keep 10%, and I loan out the other 90%, right? So I've, I'm keeping 10 euros for each person, I've got 10 people, and so that's 100 euros that I'm keeping in reserve. I'm only keeping 10%, but that's 100 euros now, because I got all these individual people, right? And so, if you come and you ask for all of your money back, I've actually got it. I only kept 10% in reserves, but that is enough to pay you back. Okay, and so I'm fine if one person comes. 
I am not fine if two people ask for their money back. Okay. So if I wanted this bank to be safer, there's kind of two ways that I could do it. One way is I could keep more in reserve, keep a higher percentage in reserve. Right? And then if I was keeping 20% in reserve, then I could have two people come back and get their money. And that would be fine. If I kept 30% in reserve, I could have three people come back and get their money, and I'd be fine. But of course, the, higher I, the more I keep back, the less I'm loaning out to somebody else and the less money I'm making. So I have a trade-off there between being safe by having a high reserve, like Corpus Bank, or being profitable and having a low reserve. And so I have to make a trade-off. Do I want to be profitable? Do I want to be safe? And somewhere in between, I'm going to decide this is how safe I want to be versus how profitable I want to be. Okay. And you can see there's always an urge to be a little bit more profitable. It's a nice thing to be profitable by loaning all this stuff out. But that's always a, a tension we've got in banking, that there's this trade-off between safety and profitability, okay. just by the amount that you keep in reserve. And there's also other things you could do, like instead of loaning it out, you could bet it on the stock market. You could take it to Vegas, put it all on black. You can do riskier things, you can do safer things when you loan it out. And when you hear about the Basel III Accords, if you're, if you're reading Financial Press, God help you, um, that's all about how do we regulate how safe their investments are. Very complicated because you have to gauge how safe investments are, but it's about saying banks, you can't be too risky when you're making these investments. Okay? But in, in the first pass, it's just really about how much do I keep in reserve. And if I keep nothing in reserve, then if anyone asks for a penny, my bank goes under, but I'm very profitable until they do. If I keep more in reserve, I'm less profitable, but I'm safer. Okay. The other way I could become safer is by having more customers. Okay. Because if I have lots of small customers, it's sort of less likely that all of them come and ask. Or, or, you know, like when I had just one customer, if you asked for 10% of your money back, I was fine. If you asked for 11% of your money back, I went under. When I had 10 customers, I could give you all of your money back. It was only if groups of customers asked for their money back. So by having more customers, I become safer as well. Okay. All right. So that's the basic trade-off in banks. Um, now, historically, what would happen is everything would be going along fine. And then, for some reason, people would want their money back all of a sudden. And why would they want their money back? Well, there's a certain Tinkerbell nature to the whole thing. Right? The whole thing works because we believe the bank is safe. If you believe the bank is safe, you're happy to have your money there. If you don't, and then the bank is fine. If you don't believe the bank is safe, you want your money out as quickly as possible, and then the bank collapses, right? because they can't give us all our money back all at once. They just can't because they loaned it out to somebody. Right. So as long as we all believe in banks and we all believe they're safe and we clap our hands, the banks are safe. As soon as we say, I don't believe in fairies, the fairy dies. Right. Silicon Valley Bank goes under. Poor Peter Thiel. Um, it, it, it's very sad for him. Um, and, and so we, we get this problem. It's based on our belief. Very much like money. right? I did, gave the same little spiel for money, that we all accept the euros because we think other people will accept them. We all put our money in the bank because we think the bank is safe. If we all think the bank is safe, the bank actually is safe. If we start thinking that the bank isn't safe, we all take our money out, and the bank will collapse. And this is a perfectly well-run bank. This is not like a bank doing fly-by-night weird stuff or anything. Perfectly well-run, safe, well-managed bank is fundamentally unable to survive if we all ask for our money out all at once. And this is so much a part of the culture back in the day that you know we have Mary Poppins. We also have A Wonderful Life. Um, it's A Wonderful Life had a bank run scene in it. It happened all the time back in the day. Okay. Okay. Then we got the Great Depression. And in the Great Depression, there were huge numbers of bank collapses, right? Because everyone's losing their job, they want their money out, and then they're worried that the banks are going to collapse, so they take their money out. It caused many, many bank collapses. And people lost their life savings, and it was grim, right? And it wasn't like in a good time to lose your life savings. Um, our, by the way, our, our co-author on the book, Ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the US Central Bank, he got famous by, by his study of the Great Depression 
and looking at the banking system and how the banking system collapses led to the money supply going down just at the time when you wanted the money supply to be going up. We'll, we'll get to that next lecture, maybe next week, somewhere in there, um, why you'd want that. But he's saying that the, this, this collapsing of, this, of the banks caused the money supply to go down because remember money supply includes checking account balances. If everyone's losing their ba bank balances, there's less money and therefore bad things happen. So after the Great Depression, or actually during the Great Depression, let me, let me, let me. during the Great Depression, we had, um, had a number of reforms. And one of the main reforms that we had, pretty much worldwide, is the introduction of automatic stabilizers. Right? That was the fiscal policy tool, one of the things that has made things so much more stable since then, I mean, they're certainly not stable yet, like, but they're so much more stable after the Great Depression than they ever were before the Great Depression. That's largely due to, to, to automatic stabilizers and deposit insurance. So what they did before, you could pretty much start a bank if you wanted. Get yourself a few hundred million and you could start a bank. It wasn't really a problem. And you could more or less run it how you want. Okay. And so we have this, if you're running it how you want, we've got this tension between I want to, to be profitable, therefore I want to keep very small amounts in reserve, but I want to be safe, so I want to keep lots in reserves. And there's this tension between them. And of course, some banks would err more towards being profitable and have very low reserves, and they would, would be the ones typically that were the first to go under. Like people would start saying, I'm worried about that bank, what are they doing? Let me get my money out. That bank would collapse, and then people would just say, I'm, I'm worried about banks in general and they would take their money out of all the banks, and those banks would collapse as well, because even a well-run bank will collapse if everyone takes their money out. Right? And so you had this kind of contagion where a badly run bank would affect all the other banks. And so as part of this general collapse of society, we said, well, we need to reform the banking sector. And what we're going to do in the banking sector is we are going to guarantee deposits so that if you have money in the bank, and the bank goes under through no fault of your own, you're just a depositor, we, as a society, will give you your money back. Okay. So if we look in 1980, um, this, this bank, Northern Rock, collapsed. Um, this is a British bank, and it's exactly the same thing. Um, that it's, people just wanted their money out, and it was perfectly reasonably run. It wasn't perfectly well run, but it was reasonably run in the fly-by-night standards of the time. Um, and if people just took their money out and the bank collapsed. So there's some details there, but, but basically it's this. Just a standard bank run, just like in Mary Poppins. Except, where's the panic? Where's the Bobbies whacking people on the head and all that that we see in Mary Poppins? Well, they're British, so of course they line up because they're British. But, <laughs> but, you know, Mary Poppins, everyone was British there too, so what's the difference, right? Well, the difference is in Mary Poppins, that was pre-Depression, and there were no bank guarantees. And so if you weren't the first one in the queue to get your money out, you were just out your money. You're just, you know, you're, you lost your life savings. Sorry, too bad for you, right? Whereas nowadays, if you got your money in Northern Rock and Northern Rock is going under, if you're the first one in the queue, yeah, you get your money back. If you're not, you get, the bank says, sorry, we don't have your money. We loaned it out to somebody. We're well run. It's there, but we're not going to get it back for a year. So at the moment, sorry, tough luck, even though we promised to give it back to you. Um, and that's a pain, and that, you're very annoyed, like seriously miffed. But you're not super seriously miffed because what you do is the, the, the Bank of England, in this case, because it's British, they come in and they take over the bank. They say, okay, they couldn't make the deposits, they couldn't keep their promises, so we own all the assets, and we'll get you your money back, and within a week, you will get your money back. Right? And so, yeah, it's annoying, and you're going to have to deal with the government, and you're going to have a week of uncertainty and weirdness, but fundamentally, in a week, you're going to be good. And so it's perfectly fine to line up, like it's, it's kind of an annoying day, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas in 1920, it would be the end of the world. You would lose your life savings. 
And that's the huge difference, why they would line up here and they didn't line up in, in, in Mary Poppins, right? Now you will notice that they didn't line up when Silicon Valley Bank went under, right? They kind of panicked. They did it all electronically, but it was a complete rich guy freak out. Everyone was, was having a cow there trying to get their money out and calling. Did you, you know, Peter Thiel famously called all his friends and told them to get their money out, and not all his friends got their money out. And other people, just not billionaires, but just multimillionaires, they couldn't get their hundred million out, and it was sad for them. But what's the difference? The difference is that there wasn't deposit insurance in a practical way on Silicon Valley Bank. Because the way the deposit insurance works is if you want to be a bank, if you want to call yourself a bank, you have to register with the banking authority and you have to obey certain rules um, to make you behave in a sensible, safe way, relatively safe way, but you get deposit insurance. And you get the deposit insurance up to a certain amount. And I think it's like 250,000 euros. Now, if you're putting in that kind of money into the bank, I don't know you and your finances, but if you're doing that, please check on the exact numbers. Don't trust me on the numbers, I'm not good with numbers, but somewhere in that order of magnitude. So if you have 200,000 euros in the bank and the bank goes under, the central bank will give you your money back within a week and you're good. If you have 50 million in the bank, there is no guarantee. You only get your first 250,000 euros back and the other 49.75 million just down the tubes. Okay. And that was the situation in Silicon Valley Bank. It was a bank that was set up primarily to deal with these venture capitalists kind of funds and, and the normal average size account was in fact 50 million. Some had people had more, some people had less, but they were all well above the deposit insurance threshold. And so for them, if the bank went under, there was this real risk that their just money was just gone. Poof, there was no guarantee on it. Whereas for you, and well, for me, and, and possibly for you, you don't have 250,000 in the bank, and therefore, if the bank goes under, you're good. In a week, you'll get it back, okay? Annoying, but, but not the end of the world. And so you could line up for Northern Rock, but you couldn't line up for Silicon Valley Bank going under, okay? Um, Silicon Valley Bank had, had another trouble, too, is that because it was all done with these very large deposits, and it was all servicing one local community, this, this you know, Silicon Valley kind of area of these, these big multi-millionaire guys um, doing business deals. So it's all these guys and they all go to the same parties and they all talk to each other and it's, it's actually a pretty small club. Which means that when Mr. Theo calls all his friends and all his friends take out money, that is actually a pretty big chunk of all of the deposits, right? So if we think about a bank like Bank of Ireland and we say, Okay, they can have 10 of us take all of our money out and not even notice. They can have 100 of us take all our money out and not even notice. They can have 1,000 of us take all our money out and they'll notice, but they'll be fine. It takes a lot of people getting together to take their money out to really bring down Allied Irish Bank. Just because they're big and they got lots and lots of small deposits. Okay? And if I call all of my friends and tell them to take their money out of AIB, as I normally do on a Tuesday, um, I don't know anything special about AIB. I'm just, just picking on them um, because they annoy me. Um, but they, there's nothing particularly wrong as far as I know with AIB. But if I do that, it's not going to affect them in any way because each of the people I know is small. And even if I know a lot of people, it's small compared to the total number of people that have money in AIB. It just doesn't matter. But Silicon Valley Bank, each of the customers was big and there were fewer of them and they all went to the same parties. And so once you start telling each other to take your money out, you get this contagion effect really quickly, right? I tell two friends, you tell two friends pretty soon, it's 50 people and that's enough to bring, about, bring down the bank, okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. important thing here, important takeaway facts from this is one, every bank, every bank we know is susceptible to these kinds of bank runs. It is, less worrying and less likely to happen to banks that mostly have small deposits because they're insured, therefore nobody panics. And you say, the bank is going under, and I say, oh, but I got basketball on Tuesday, I can't be gone, right? And it's okay because a week later I'm gonna get my money back. But if I didn't have deposit insurance, I would cancel the basketball, I'd go get my money back, right? And so 
It's a very different kind of calculus you do. The other thing is that, that sort of in exchange for this deposit insurance, we have regulated the banks. And we've regulated the banks in ways to try to keep them from being too fragile. They're always going to be fragile. There's always this Tinkerbell nature to the thing. But we've tried to keep them from being too fragile. So one of the things we say is, for example, you cannot, cannot have any level of reserves you want. There is a minimum reserve requirement. This is the, the required reserves is the jargon. You're required to have, say, 5% in reserve. If someone deposits 100 euros, you've got to keep 5 euros in the, in, the, in the vault. And then you can loan out the other 95 euros. Okay? Now, if you want, you can keep more in reserve. If you think, oh, we're coming up to St. Paddy's Day, people are going to be spending like there's no tomorrow, I think everyone's going to take their money out of the, the bank, let me make sure there's a little extra in there so that I can deal with the high demand. Right? And you can keep 10% in reserves if you want to be particularly safe. But you can't keep 3% in reserves. Right? There's a minimum that you can go to. And that is part of the whole banking regulation things to keep you from doing really risky things. Um, the other thing is that you're going to take the 95% and you're going to loan it out to somebody. And we have requirements on what kind of loans you can make. Now this gets really, really super complicated because we have to gauge the risk of, a, of various kinds of loans you can make. And it's not just, is this thing risky, but is this, if you, you sort of give two different types of loans, are they likely to collapse at the same time? So it might be, even though it's two different types of loans, they're both likely to go under at the same time. So you could be making home loans in, in Dublin, and you could be making commercial loans in Dublin. Well, if you think home prices and, and commercial loans kind of go together, just the general swing of things, then that's not really two different sorts of things. And so we have to, to figure out how do things move together. And so that's Basel III, which is the banking regulation on how risky they can behave. Super complicated, but it's just about that. How do we gauge the risk of the things they're loaning out? So one of the things that Silicon Valley Bank did, which is, is kind of interesting because we talked about bonds, is they had a lot of, the, the, the banking regulation is you know, you, you, you're going to be making these loans, and you can only have a certain amount of risk. But you're going to have various things you're, you're going to do with the money. You're going to give some, if you're Silicon Valley Bank, you're going to give some to some venture capitalists and loan them $100 million to do their thing. Right? So that's a very risky loan, but it maybe pays off and you get a high interest return on it. And then you're going to have some that you just keep for liquidity because you want to be, be sure to be able to get it back pretty quickly. And so you could, for example, loan to the U.S. government. Right? That is buy a bond. Right? Bonds are just IOUs from the U.S. government. You could buy one of those bonds and now the U.S. government owes you money. And you've loaned money to the U.S. government. Good for you. Very patriotic. And you could do that. And the nice thing about that is that is, a, that is a very liquid asset. It's true that the US government's only going to pay you back after 30 years, but anytime you want, you can sell that bond to somebody else. It's a very liquid market. It's very easy to sell. You can decide at 3 o'clock to sell it. By 3.30, it's sold. Right, so it's very easy to get that money out. Okay. But we know from, from the bonds that we sold in class that, that bond prices and interest rates are really the same information. If the government's going to pay back 10,000 euros and I pay 9,000 euros for that thing, that's a 10% interest rate. I'm getting roughly 10% return on my money. Right? If I buy that same bond for 9,500, then I'm getting about a 5% interest rate. Okay? So what happened is that Silicon Valley Bank took a lot of their money. What triggered this whole thing? Right? It's always fragile, but what was the particular trigger here was Silicon Valley Bank because they're in this venture capital kind of world, they need to be very liquid. They need to be moving their money in and out pretty quickly to make these big, big loans to someone. I need to buy Amazon. And so you need the money to buy Amazon on Tuesday. And so you need to have your assets in something fairly liquid. And so what they did is they bought US Treasury bonds. That is, they loaned money to the US government. Right? Perfectly fine, a very, they say, safe investment, because you can trust the US government, apparently. Well, not that they've ever lied to us before, but, but um, apparently you can trust them. And so people do. And it's considered in Basel III as a very safe investment, for better or worse. And so they, they do this, okay, keeping it liquid. Nice. 
Then, of course, we've been in sort of a post-recession, post-crisis situation for the last 10 years, since 2007. And so because of this, for reasons that we'll get into next week, um, we've had the interest rate really, really low, which means your $10,000 bond, with the, where they're going to pay you $10,000 at the end, was selling for pretty close to $10,000. Right? And so you buy $10,000 worth of bonds. And then we start having inflation, and the U.S. government, as part of this, or the U.S. Central Bank, has, has raised the interest rate, okay? just as a general policy. For again, reasons we'll get to next week. Um, so they've raised the interest rate, which means the price of bonds has gone down. Right? So you have this, ten, this investment worth 10,000 euros that all of a sudden has gone down in value. So now it's worth 9,000 euros. You lost 10% of your investment. Right? Now, if you hold it for the 30 years, eventually the US government's going to pay you back. You're fine. But if you need liquidity quickly, you used to have 10,000 in liquidity. Now you've got 9,000. And so all of a sudden, people saw that, that these guys had less, you know, the, the value of their assets were going down. And that's what triggered the, the panic in the first place. People said, look, they, they were being perfectly well run. Economic conditions has changed. Now they don't look so strong. Let me get my money out. Okay. Now, if everyone got their money out, even in the best of times, they still would have gone under. But this is what sort of started the run. Right? Whereas in Mary Poppins, it was the kid that couldn't get his tuppence back. But it's the same thing. Right? Honestly, it's the same thing. It doesn't sound like it's the same thing, but honestly, it is. Right? All right. That's how banks work. Um, of course, it gets much more and more more complicated. You can, you can get it as complicated as you want, and we will come back to this in a lecture or so and make it slightly more complicated for our story, but this is fundamentally how banks work. Okay. So now we want to talk about demand for money. So that, that's Silicon Valley Bank, um, who we'll come back to. The demand for money. So we're going to have a supply and demand for money. You've, you've seen economics before, right? There's a line going up, there's a line going down, there's a magic point where they cross. You can go a long, long way in economics with line up, line down, magic point where they cross. You'll be pretty good. Um, this is what we're going to have. We're going to have money demand, we're going to have money supply. Magic point where they cross is going to tell us everything. So what is this money demand? Um, now, at first glance to, to all humans, I think, Saying money demand sounds weird, right? Because if somebody asks you, how much money do you want, the only reasonable answer is all of it, right? And so what is this money demand? Well, we're, we're, think about the market for shoes. Right? So who had supply and demand for shoes in micro? I always like, harass the poor micro people about the shoes. Um, supply and demand for shoes, and we say, Here's the price of shoes. Here's how many you, you decide to buy. Right? That's the demand curve. If the price is high, you buy less shoes. If the price is low, you buy more shoes. Okay? Well, how many shoes do you want is a different question. Right? How many shoes do you want if you were totally unconstrained by anything in your life? Some people would say all of us. Imelda Marcos famously had warehouses full of shoes. That she kind of, I, I don't know, she, she had thousands of shoes, thousands of expensive designer shoes when they kicked her out of office. Um, so that's the thing. Some people want all the shoes, just like the rest of us want all the money. Um, but most of us don't get all of the shoes, even if we want all the shoes. Why? Because we have constraints. We have a budget. And we say, look, I only have so much wealth. Do I really want to use it all for shoes, or maybe do I want to eat this month? And so we trade off the eating versus the shoes, and we make a thing. If the shoes are cheap, yeah, we'll buy more shoes. If the shoes are expensive, we'll buy less shoes. Right? Simple, not too much to it. Money is the same way. Okay? Money is you've got a certain amount of wealth. You could take all your wealth and put it into money, or you could take your wealth and put it into something else. You can take all your wealth, put it into shoes, or you can take all your wealth and put it into food or some combination of the two. Right? It's exactly the same idea. So you have a certain amount of wealth, and you decide how to divide it up between money, a liquid asset, and other assets that you might want. Okay. Okay. This is called a portfolio allocation um, decision. You got <coughs> this wealth, and you have to allocate it amongst your portfolio. Okay. Okay. 
Now we will assume for the purposes of this class that money carries zero interest rate. This is not necessarily true. Um, this is just a to simplify things. Um, if you go back to like early bank notes, for instance, where the banks were issuing the notes, a lot of them would have an interest payment scheme on it. If you bring us back, this back before April, we'll give you so much gold. If you bring it after May, we'll give you so much more gold and so on and so forth. And they would pay interest on these notes. That was a thing. And that, that, like a, a, a quirk of history. But in principle, even notes can pay interest. But more to the point, we are thinking of bank account balances as money. Right? We're thinking about checking account balances are money, and checking accounts can pay interest. Right? For you and me, I don't know you, but for me, I don't have enough in the bank that they're going to pay me interest. I'm, I'm good if I can get them to waive the fees. Um, most of you probably can't get them to waive the fees, and so the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, yay. Um, but if you are Hewlett Packard, and you are thinking, I want to put my payroll in AIB, you can make a deal, right? You're going to be putting 100 million a month in a bank account. You can make a deal with them while they're going to pay you interest on that, right? And if they don't do it, Bank of Ireland will, right? So you, you can, you know, they really want that 100 million and they will give you something to get it. So large bank accounts, business bank accounts, which are a big chunk of the bank accounts, actually do pay interest, okay? Just not for you and me, okay? Um, nevertheless, they pay less interest than you could do using your wealth for something else. And that's going to be the trade-off we're going to look at. You're going to have some wealth, and you can either do something, sort of invest it, or you can put it in a liquid asset, money, something easy to spend. And the more you, of your wealth you put into money, the less you can use for building a factory or buying a government bond or anything like that. And the more you put into buying a government bond or building a factory, the less you can hold in cash. Okay. And that's going to be our thing. So just to, to make it easy, we'll pay, say we have zero nominal interest rate. Okay. So if we have zero nominal interest rate on money, or low nominal interest rate on money, well, what function is money in this case not serving very well? Clearly store of value, right? Because we've said we've ordered our things by liquidity, by, by how good it is as a medium of exchange, and we've kind of ignored the other functions of money, in particular store of value. And that's going to be typical of what we're going to have, is that when things are very liquid, that is, they're good as a medium of exchange, they're going to tend to be bad as a store of value. It's not a universal law, but it tends to be the case. Okay? So we're really picking and choosing and playing favorites with the functions of money. We're saying medium of exchange is the one we care about here, and screw you, store of value. We're not, not, not concerned about you. So if, I, don't know, I, I think this is that probably more confusing than anything. So the, if we have, have zero nominal interest rate, then the re real return on money is minus the inflation rate. Now this is just saying, if you take all your wealth and you stick it under your mattress and prices go up, you can buy less stuff at the end of the year than you could at the beginning of the year, right? So our key factor in, ter in terms of determining how much money we want to hold, or the one that we're going to focus on, it's not the most important one, but it is the one we're going to focus on, is going to be the nominal interest rate on other things you could do. Right, so I have, I'm going to think about, my, I got all this wealth, and I have two choices. I could buy a government bond, or I could put it in the bank. Right? If I put it in the bank, I get no nominal interest, Whereas if I put it in a government bond, I get the nominal interest rate. Either way, inflation's gonna happen to me. It's, it's sad, but it's true. Either way, inflation's gonna happen. And so the difference between these two is the nominal interest rate. If I put my wealth in the bank, I get, get something that's really easy to spend, and that's nice. If I put it in government bonds, I get a return on my, on my money. And so I get an interest return. And so it's a trade-off between this interest return and the ease of spending the thing. And then you think, well, if the interest is rate is, is zero, for instance, then I might as well have all my wealth easy to spend because I don't get anything by loaning it to the government, so screw the government. 
But if the interest rate is 100% and they're doubling my money every year, then all of a sudden putting the wealth, in, taking it out of the bank and buying a government bond seems really attractive. Right? So the higher the interest rate, the less money I'm going to hold. Right? Because we've made a distinction between holding my wealth in terms of a, a liquid asset and putting it into something that pays an interest return. Okay? So the nominal interest rate is the price of money. It is what I am giving up by holding my wealth in terms of money instead of doing something else with it that's going to pay this interest. Okay? It's just the price of money. And it's weird, I know, to think about money having a price, but a price is just what you give up to get something. Right? And to get money, you are giving up this return from the things, other things that you could have done with that wealth. Okay? So it is going to operate just like a price of shoes. It's not going to be any different at all, other than it sounds different, but it's not any different at all than the price of shoes. Price of shoes goes up, you want less shoes because you want to eat. Price of shoes go down, you want more shoes. Interest rate goes down, the price of money goes down. You're giving up less by holding your wealth in liquid assets, and you never know, you might be invited to Barbados. It would be nice to have the, the liquidity to do it. Right? And so you'll hold more of your wealth in terms of money. Right. Now this is our money demand curve. It looks like this. Here, the amount of money that we hold. Remember, this is particularly, we're thinking, checking account balances here. The amount that we have in our checking account is going to be a downward sloping of, slope of, downward sloping function of the interest rate. That is, if the interest rate is really low, we don't get much by doing anything but keeping your money in the bank. You might as well keep your wealth in the bank just in case something comes up, because you're not getting much by doing anything else. And so you keep a lot of your wealth in the bank. If the interest rate goes up, that's the price of money going up, that is you're giving up a lot to hold money, then there's all these great other opportunities of things to do with your wealth besides holding it in liquid assets. And so you hold less of it in liquid assets. Right? And you do these other great things instead. Ideally, you could do both, but you're constrained. You only got so much wealth, and so you're willing to forego, OK, maybe, maybe I can't on a whim you know, go out for pizza this weekend, but I'm going to get so rich on the interest earnings that it's worth it. Right? And so this is the situation. Um, now, one of the things here that, that is kind of weird, and I'd like you to, to notice that it's kind of weird, is this is not the way that the vast majority of you guys think. Right? Have you ever thought this way when you're deciding how much money to have? No. Right? It's, it's just not a thing. And that's because you have so little wealth, it's sad. Um, but if you have a big pot, right, you're just trying to get by to the next pizza. And that, that's about all there is to it. Um, but as you get more, this becomes more of a thing. You have more sort of as a, as a rainy day fund. And certainly companies do this all the time. Right? They decide how much they want to keep in, in terms of liquid assets versus, versus investing. Right? And and this is based very much on the interest rate. Now, even for companies, though, the interest rate is not the most important thing in their decision. The most important thing is how much do I owe my, my employees at the end of the month. That's the thing that really fixes it for them. Right? So interest rate isn't crucial for, for, for companies, but we are going to fixate on the interest rate quite a lot, not because it's the most important thing, but because it's going to be our connection between the financial markets and the real side of the economy. Okay, so it's not that it's the most important thing, but it is the thing that connects financial markets with real stuff. And so therefore, it's important to us. Okay, it's not that that's why companies are, are holding money, but it does affect the amount that they hold. OK, I will let you go, and see you on Friday. <laughs>